This is Dateline News and Conversation. Before I introduce my guest and the topic, I want to encourage you, if you haven't already, to join the Friends of Crimea, Friends of Russia Telegram channel. You can do that by going to Telegram and typing in the address below, or just type it into your browser. You will find a daily aggregation of all the news that's fit to print about Russia, Russia and international events and affairs, about BRICS, and about the war in Ukraine. Once again, I encourage you to join this channel to get the latest of real news about Russia. My guest tonight is an old and a dear friend. She's an activist. She ran against Susan Collins for the United States Senate. She's a former school teacher. She writes a daily blog. We're going to talk to her tonight about an article she wrote this week entitled, What Do You Tell Your Children About 9-11? Lisa Savage, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Regis. Thanks for having me. It's good to see you. It's always a pleasure. Now, I read this article a couple of days ago, and I think you probably published it on 9-11. I did. Uh, you know, it got me to thinking, uh, this was the first paragraph, sentence that you wrote in that blog. And I'm going to quote it. The empire never stops churning out soft propaganda to make sure kids in the U.S. are confused about their government's wrongdoings. Now, your article was about 9-11, but you know what? It got me to thinking about what the U.S. government had been doing and has been doing for my entire life, but really for the last 400 years. Uh, we were taught Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492, and he discovered what the Indians in America had already discovered. And then, you know, from that first myth, and I call it a lie, that soft propaganda, whatever you want to call it. We went from that to the pilgrims that had the first Thanksgiving. They celebrated with the Indians who saved them because these people from England didn't know how to survive. But the truth of the matter was Columbus and those who followed him brought slavery to the Americas and murdered maybe 100 million Native Americans just in what is now North America. And it was one myth or one soft propaganda story that we were told growing up. And it's over these 400 years. And it's all been, I think I like what you call it, soft propaganda to make sure that kids, and when we grew up, were confused about their government's wrongdoings. And then, Lisa, I thought about something that I've been focusing on with several of my con colleagues and friends in this part of the world, from Serbia to Germany to Australia to Norway to Sweden to Armenia to Abkhazia, and here in Russia, is the use of soft power by the United States to influence the thinking and the values and the culture of these countries to sway them towards the American and Western way of thinking, economy, and values. It's been devastating, but people are waking up to it. And this is what I want to talk to you about tonight. I really enjoyed this article, What Do You Tell Your Children About 9-11? We probably also could have said, what do we tell our children about JFK? Um, 
it's in the same genre. But what motivated you, Lisa, to write this article? Well, I write my blog, uh, Regis, mostly for the purpose of keeping my head from exploding when I <clears throat> view the current events of the day and the trends of having been a history student in my youth and teaching history and other subjects for many years. Um, I basically write my blog as a you know release valve for my frustration over how what a waste of resources my imperial government is and you know intends to continue being. Um, but of course, when you have young children either in your care or in your extended family or as students, um, it's tricky to know how much uh, to tell them how much truth they're developmentally ready to handle. And of course, if it's not my own child, there's the issue of is this what you know? Are their parents okay with? Uh, what I'm saying. But, you know, I've been a blogger for some years now. Every 9-11, I tend to think about and write about those events. Um, one of my own children was still at home when uh, the uh, events of 9-11 happened and was and the internet was just coming into being. And he was of an age that he became obsessed, literally, with the events of 9-11 for years. And after four or five years of it, he did a research project in school that um, impressed his teachers about 9-11. But, um, you know, uh, time goes on. My hair is gray now. Now they're grandchildren, <laughs> young young children in the family again. Um, when I say soft propaganda, I don't necessarily mean history textbooks. I completely agree with you, Regis, that they misled us, willfully misled us. Um, but I would consider that just straight ahead propaganda. Soft propaganda is uh, masquerades often as entertainment, uh, culture, uh, literature, those kind of things, so that you you get the uh, information in wrapped in a sweet, you know, sugar coating of uh, something that's pleasant to ingest. And I've been had this on my mind because my husband was reading to uh, some of our our young grandchildren at bedtime, and when he came out, he had the library book about I survived the you know September 11th, the Twin Towers which is a series of historical fiction aimed at kids. And he said, my husband was like, whoa, <laughs> you know, that, that, was, that was not a good book necessarily. Um, and so it started me thinking that I probably should say something to the child that uh, really, really likes that series. You always don't wanna tell kids what to think. You're trying to help them know how to think. But at the same time, uh, there's never going to be a crack in the facade of imperial soft propaganda where a young school age child is going to see the reality peeking through the cracks. You know, it's pretty much a seamless front to them. And so to say, you know, because they're seeing it on TV, they're seeing it's every sports event is going to have all oh, the heroes of 9-11. And there's a lot, a lot of mythology about that event. I began realizing 10 years ago teaching school Oh, they have to work hard to keep 9-11 current with kids because they didn't they have no idea what 9-11 was. And I would say, you know, it, as opposed to JFK's assassination, um, about which I have similar uh, suspicions and questions. But again, kids today, JFK was assassinated. That's not a, a historical event they know about. But, you know, this per the young person in my family has now become obsessed with uh, telling telling their cousin, don't go to New York City, that's where the Twin Towers fell. You know, that kind of mythology of be scared, be scared. And, um, you know, telling telling the truth that, hey, your government, you know, was complicit. I didn't use the word complicit, but, you know, 9-11 was done by your government. And then realizing I also need to warn them, school's just starting here in the States. And if you say this at school, people will probably get mad at you. Um, I'm confident that, you know, that child's parents are okay with me saying those things. Um, and that it becomes an overall question when you're educating is exactly how much truth are you going to tell? The 9-11 truther thing is interesting because um, at the beginning of uh, the um, war in Afghanistan, or even more particularly Iraq, there were a lot of infiltrators in the anti-war movement that presented themselves as 9-11 truthers like they wanted to, you know, and people, it takes people a while to figure out a deception that big, the pandemic, the 9-11, you know, it's huge and it's right in your face and it takes a while to sort through the 
I always look at, well, what was it used for? <laughs> These events, you know, I don't know who exactly planned them or carried them out, but what was the event used for? What was the aftermath? Patriot Act, creation of Department of Homeland Security, you know, and so forth. Um, but I think that it's important to, um, you know, be honest with kids and help them sift through all this cultural claptrap. One of the things I found encouraging recently is, uh, you know, um, the willingness of a military age person in the United States to consider enlisting has been dropping like a stone since the war, since 9-11. And it's now at 9%. So people that are qualified to enlist and are of the age band that's considered, only 9% will even consider it. Um, and even military families are telling their children, don't enlist. You know, it's you're just fighting for corporate profits. It's not what they say it is and so forth. So in some ways, all this propaganda isn't working. There hasn't been a sports event since 9-11 that didn't have some kind of patriotic, you know, support the troops, thank, you know, and so forth. It's 24-7 in America, but it's kind of not working because there are more homeless people in every single city in the uh, U.S. constantly, visibly suffering, living on the pavement. Nobody has adequate health care. Even those of us with good health insurance don't have adequate health care in the U.S. And um, there are just so many things that, you know, the infrastructure is crumbling. Uh, the inflationary, uh, especially cost of rent uh, uh, and how home purchases and food have skyrocketed and they're not going down. So people know things are wrong, uh, but they tend to, it's hard for people to delve into that level of mythology about 9-11. What I started to say about the infiltration in the anti-war movement is they were very disruptive. They were insistent on telling their their version of the 9-11 truth story, and they would storm the podium at an anti-war conference and try to yank the microphone out of your hand type of level of disruption. You know, most of us were kind of on to them and tried to, you know, uh, go on with our work and let the let the disruption subside. But <clears throat> it's very, very clever uh, infiltration to make sure that, you know, um, a, this was, wasn't this the original? Well, a JFK is probably the original conspiracy theory. Now, anything people say that's against the prevailing narrative of we're in Ukraine for freedom and democracy or all these wars, we were just bringing the good life to people, uh, they call you a conspiracy theorist. Um, so if you question the 9-11 official narrative, if you question the JFK official narrative, you're a conspiracy theorist. Um, it was very clever of them to have these really disruptive, aggressive conspiracy theory, theory spouting people be the sort of original 9-11 truthers. Um, I can remember uh, uh, my youngest child saying, uh, he, again, he was obsessed with 9-11 for years and he read everything and followed everything. And I can remember him saying to me, oh, you know, the, the anti-war movement, nothing good in the anti-war movement will come of, you know, you allying with the, with those people because he saw them as sort of um, right-wing disruptors. Uh, but, the you know, the distinctions between left and right are becoming increasingly uh, less meaningful here in this country. It's really about the 1%, the billionaire class, and the rest of us that are, um, you know, barely hanging on to being able to take care of ourselves and our families. Um, so it's probably risky for me to say what I believe is the truth about 9-11. Um, but I was lucky enough to have parents that were willing to um, question the prevailing narratives and ask, you know, they always, my dad always sent us off to school in the morning saying, ask smart questions. Um, and uh, so I feel lucky to be able to pass that on to future generations. And I was very glad that the the child that I shared this with, you know, like your government was involved and they'll get mad at you. Some people at school wouldn't want to hear that. He was skeptical of both those statements. And that made me feel good. He should be skeptical of those kind of statements. Um, so that's why I wrote the blog post reflecting on my adventure. All right. And, you know. I, I'm with you on all of that. Absolutely all of it. Um, it's unfortunate that uh, most Americans, Europeans, can't wrap their heads around it. But I'm going to get to that in a minute. Uh, 
I want to get back to the soft propaganda that they use in the classrooms. Um, in your blog, you talked about a publishing company, Scholastic, which does, you, and I quote, a lot of the heavy lifting around selling pro-war, pro-imperialism narratives to kids. Lisa, you were a school teacher. You know how it worked. Tell me, because I'm not really aware of it. So, I, yeah. I didn't teach. I didn't teach. I, I taught high school for six years in the 70s. There was none of it there. Yeah, a recruiter would come to school, would talk to some of the kids that were interested, but that was it. So what were you talking about with this publishing company? Yeah, this is more for younger kids, really, because... Um... Scholastic is a publishing company that publishes hundreds of trade books, fiction and nonfiction titles intended for uh, children. And they do a, a very packaged turnkey book fair for schools that meant all the schools that I worked in in Maine anyway, twice a year would have this book fair, usually uh, set up in the library uh, where kids could come and spend money on uh, not only books, but, you know, little erasers and that sort of thing. It was a popular a thing uh, this it would generate free books for the school <clears throat> scholastic is a company that generously gives away a lot of free or very low cost materials to teachers <clears throat> and um but over the years over decades of watching uh their content i would say it is very militaristic their historical fiction is a very very traditional view of settler colonial um you know uh, we are always the heroes. The white people are always the heroes and the indigenous people are always the um, not the heroes of the American history story. And um, so these books are pervasive. Uh, kids take home book orders. Teachers earn classroom books by sending home an order sheet and people, kids can order from Scholastic and other companies. But I mean, I have for years seen books in the Scholastic Book Fair that literally have GI uh, soldiers dog tags like um you know, for kids, a replica that they could wear around their neck on a chain like soldiers. Um, and the book would be in camo. And a lot, a lot of the titles are going to be about wars. This I Survive series has been popular for a really long time. Now they're redoing the series as graphic novels. And some of them are just natural disasters. Some of them are, um, uh, you know, disasters like the Titanic. But a lot of them are, I survived Pearl Harbor, I survived 9-11, I survived the Revolutionary War, I survived the Civil War. You know, U.S. history is only taught as a series of wars um, in which history began with white people coming to this continent, even though there had been indigenous people with highly developed, um, you know, ways of living and cultures here in this continent for tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of years prior to Europeans bringing their version of civilization and culture. Um, but that, you know, that's just a standard. That's what I mean by soft propaganda. It's the mindset and the, you know, just look here is what propaganda does best. Nothing outside this. Now, of course, good teachers are looking way beyond scholastic for their classroom libraries, their curricula. But you cannot save, you would have to go live in the woods and homeschool your children to ever keep, to keep them from being in contact with this very commercialized education culture I'm talking about. There are many, many more examples of commercialized pub public, but commercialized education in the US because everything is commodified here. Nothing is a human right like education. Uh, you know, it's always a profit opportunity for somebody. And um, so this I Survive series is particularly pernicious, I think. It appeals um, to especially uh, those kind of historical fiction appeal to kids that age. You know, they don't know about what happened before. I'll tell you a funny story. I once had a prospective student. I hadn't had him yet for ninth grade social studies, but uh, he, I was at a barbecue in the summer and he was there and um, I knew he was going to be my student. So I said, you know, is social studies a subject that you like? And he said, well, I used to like it till we had to study the pilgrims every year. And I said, really every year? And he said, well, yeah, pretty much. Um, we would. I said, well, what grades do you study the pilgrims? He's like fourth grade, fifth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade. And I, you know, kind of impulsively said, are you patriotic yet? He said, I used to be. <laughs> he was a very intelligent and, and uh, very cynical, but interesting student. 
um, who was just, again, he, you know, he could see it, um, but it, it is invisible to many that you are being sold a very narrow little tiny window to look at reality through. And that's all you're supposed to see. Um, even in high school uh, history classes, it used to, it used to be the case that you never uh, teaching U.S. history. They never even got as far as the Vietnam War. They would get as far as usually like the Civil War, maybe World War One, uh, and then you know World War Two would be rushed in the last couple of weeks of school. Maybe that was before the Hitler Channel. They call hit, the History Channel is called slang. The Hitler Channel by high school students because every other show is about how America won World War Two and vanquished Hitler, saved the people in the concentration camps, which is of course silly because. Soviet Union uh, defeated Germany and um, the, uh, you know, Americans uh, flew the Nazis to the U.S. to become rocket scientists and biological warfare specialists for us. And uh, gosh, they're still here. You know, they were the, the first head of NASA uh, was such a person, but nobody ever gets taught that. You're just taught this narrative of, um, you know, World War II as being this heroic effort by the U.S., um, you know, it, we just have a sort of historical amnesia in this country and it's by design. And most people couldn't even really tell you much probably about the dropping of the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And if they did, what they'd say is, well, it saved a lot of, uh, you know, uh, U.S. soldiers' lives and allied soldiers' lives because we didn't have to do a ground invasion of Japan. That is nonsense. Japan was already in the process of surrendering when the first bond dropped, not even to mention the second. Um, so, you know, a lot of people think it is implausible to them that your own government would stage something like 9-11 and kill that many people just to ram some bad laws through. Uh, but if you look at the fact that they bombed Hiroshima and then Nagasaki just to test a different kind of atomic weapon to just to show the Soviet Union like, hey, you know, we've got these terrible weapons and we're prepared to use them on your civilian populations. They never teach you history like that in U.S. public schools. So I enjoyed being a renegade. I probably get run out of town on a rail these days, but I've been retired for a couple of years now. Um, and, uh, you know, if you don't know the truth about your history and what your country has done, you can't really understand geopolitical reality now, can you? You don't really know uh, where you came from and uh, where that could lead. So, but the U.S. populace is kept in a state of ignorance deliberately so that they don't object to these nefarious schemes of starting World War III because that's going to benefit who exactly? Yeah, you know, uh, it wasn't until very late in life that I woke up. Um, it, it took a long time. Uh, going to Rome to study uh, for four years, uh, 1968 to 72, began to open my eyes about how other people saw the United States and the history of the United States. My undergraduate degree was in United States history, and I never learned the real history of the United States until many years later, when my eyes were open and I began to research it. Now, you you said something else that, gosh, I think was so important. You said consuming stories about peril, like fantasy tales or historical, fi historical fiction is a way to process our fears as fragile human beings. I want to talk about fear now just for an, a, a bit. Uh, you can go back all the way back in history as far as you want. All these wars were really about instilling fear in the American people. There was some Hitler or some evil person that we were afraid of. And it was fear that mobilized, I believe, the American people. It's fear that mobilizes any people. The assassination of John F. Kennedy. There were a lot of reasons for that. He made a lot of enemies. He wanted peace with the Soviet Union, with Nikita Khrushchev. Oh, my God. The Soviet Union was the greatest fear, the greatest peril 
that existed. And Kennedy wanted to make peace with them, to end the Cold War. You look at 9-11. My God, if that was not about instilling fear in the American public and the public of the world, I don't know what was. You mentioned it was the creation of homeland security. Jesus, everywhere we went, we had metal detectors. We had to go through investigations and screenings at airports. We had to take off our shoes, open our suitcases. And that was followed on very quickly by the Patriot Act, the National Defense Authorization Act. Oh, my God, we are being attacked internally by terrorists, domestic terrorists. More fear. And then finally, the Domestic Terrorist Act, which was passed by the great, the great chameleon, not, com not comedian, chameleon Barack Obama, the National Defense Terrorist Act. People like you and me who counted the official narrative could now be declared as domestic terrorists. When you talk about instilling fear in the public, and I'm thinking about what you wrote in your your blog about how they instill this fear in our children with these fairy tales or historical fiction. Talk to me a little bit more about that because kids are so impressionable, but you know what? So are most adults. <laughs> That's for sure. Well, I think that, you know, uh, the human um, tendency to feel fearful is inborn. I, I don't think fairy tales necessarily are causing the fear. Fairy tales are popular, especially with kids. Adults will always say, often say, isn't this too scary? And the kid's like, no, no, keep going. You know, because kids have fears. They fear that the dark and they fear that adults won't be there for them and that they might get hit by a car and lots of things. They fear that their parents seem worried and fearful. Um, but our government certainly, as you said, Regis, deliberately preys on our fears and magnifies them and interprets everything through that lens. Um, if we were a healthy society, we would be helping children uh, feel less fearful, not more fearful. You know, the word threat, when I read the bureaucraties uh, propaganda that spews from the State Department or the White House or the Pentagon, they often use the word threat threat. Like China is the new threat, you know, and if you hear it enough times, you believe it. But if you're really paying attention, you realize like, you know, China hasn't invaded anyone, started a war. The U.S. is the threat. If there, if there is a country that is the top of everyone's threat list, and many uh, surveys have shown this, you know, international surveys, who do you think is the most dangerous country? Hands down, it's the United States. We're the ones always uh, sending our bombers and just, you know, bombing randomly uh, countries that we want to control the natural resources of. They never really delve into that aspect of the story when they're telling kids about a war. It's always one side is false dichotomy is very important. There's two sides. One's good, one's bad. And, you know, the, the hero's always on the good allied with the good side. And then everything's personified. You know, there's a main character who is under threat, who is vulnerable, and the adventures of this person and bringing them to safety. You know, it's a classic literary uh, construction, but it's put very much in the service of this soft propaganda about U.S. history and about um, America's standing in the world. This is the basis of what is often termed American exceptionalism. This is why American children grow up or, you know, in the U.S. thinking that we there's something exceptional about our country and our culture because they get, you know, sold this uh, line many, many times. Um, and until you travel abroad, just like you said, when you first went to Rome, you suddenly see our country through other eyes and talk to other people, read their newspapers or uh, watch their TV and you start to realize how limited your point of view has been. Um, so, but you know, the consensus is crumbling. You can manufacture consent for a while, especially in a society where, you know, a, a good chunk of the people are reasonably affluent. Nowadays, a good chunk of the people are uh, reasonably struggling to pay their bills. It's always been the case 
for uh, people of color, the indigenous people also that their resources were stolen. Nobody ever had this great America that all the groups said, yeah, those were the good old days. You know, people of color would say those were never the good old days. Now white working class people are realizing, wow, this isn't the good old days. Um, so, but I see the propaganda ramped up, you know, more and more vociferous all the time, but it's working less and less. Uh, so I think that the evil empire has its back against the wall at this point with multipolarity breaking out all over the place. And probably their proxy war in Ukraine is going to be seen in historical hindsight as the place where they really stepped wrong. The war on terror too, were horrible mistakes, but I think this was their, is going to be their fatal error that will unravel NATO and, you know, the domination of the world. I'll leave you with one last scholastic image, Regis. There's a book called Diary of a Spider. It's just like a pretend book, a made up spider character. One of my other grandchildren loves spiders. So I've read this book so many times. And one of the fun facts is, hey, if it weren't for spiders, insects might take over the world because spiders eat a lot of insects. The illustration Scholastic chose for that page shows an insect dressed in a suit and a red tie with the seal of the president of the United States behind him and two flags on either side. This is the visual that Scholastic offers like third graders for taking over the world. It's subtle, but, you know, not once you start really yeah. looking at it, realizing how do they get away with this stuff? You know, they do, and it's powerful. Um, when you talk about instilling fear and propaganda, uh, I've recently had brief conversations with one of my children and a couple of very good longtime friends. They stated... <clears throat> very clearly and emphatically, Vladimir Putin was a dictator, an assassin, a killer. They stated it as fact. And then they, they went on to say, the Russian government is bad. And I, I said to each of them, who told you this? Where did you get this? How do you know? And if you even want to compare Putin with any president since John Kennedy and the Russian, gov Russian government, it's no longer the Soviet Union, it's no longer communism, the Russian government for the last 23 years, there is such a stark difference between American presidents who are the real war criminals and assassins just in the last... 78 years that I've been around, supposedly those presidents have killed 21 to 25 million innocent victims in innocent nations around the world. The United States has invaded, I mean, I don't even want to list the countries. The major ones are Vietnam, Afghanistan, Syria, Libya, uh, and Iraq. And when you look at the other side of the ledger, there's nothing there that Russia has done. Oh, they'll mention Georgia. They'll mention Chechnya. They'll mention South Ossetia. These were all territories that Ru Russia was obliged to protect with their own security alliances. These people are totally unaware. And it just emphasizes how powerful the propaganda and the fear factor is mm -hmm. in making people absolutely blind and not open to reality. Now, well, you and I have discussed before uh, the the whole thing of in in the U.S. They took uh, made Trump into the liberal media made Trump into just the boogeyman beyond you know he was just evil incarnate, and they linked Trump with Putin constantly in their news coverage, so that once Trump was no longer in office. Um, they, it was very easy to just slot Putin into this whole hate, uh, you know, sort of structure that most liberals in this country had built for themselves. And the, you know, the vehemence with which they denounce uh, Putin is really, they don't really know anything really about Russia or its president. Um, but they have, you know, 
uh, consumed a lot of hard propaganda on that subject. Um, so they, they think they know. Um, but, you know, part of what's happening is that people are being set up to always, this is what I mean about the Hitler channel. When I was teaching high school, you know, 20 years ago, um, why were my students chuckling and going, oh yeah, the Hitler channel, ha ha, everything on there is about how bad Hitler is. Well, once Americans all have that construct firmly implanted, then you just need to say, oh, Putin is the next Hitler or whoever is the next Hitler. And, you know, they've got the concept ready to go. Like the personification to me is silly too. Putin obviously has, you know, some power and certainly some standing in the world compared to our president, Joe Biden, who is clearly losing, you know, is, is in the stages of dementia. Um, but it's a huge country with lots of people and constituencies. And um, here in the U.S., we know who's in control. The corporations are in control. They control the White House. They control both houses of Congress. They control the Supreme Court. They control our state governments. In many cases, they control even our local governments. Um, that's who, you know, unelected and um, unaccountable to us, the people. Although yesterday, they close. They has, there was an action for. There's a climate march on Sunday in New York City, and um, one of the groups denied access to Citibank, which is the second largest funder of fossil fuel companies, um, investment bank. They denied all the employees of Citibank the ability to go through the doors and go to work. They were probably all just working on their phones, but still. Um, you know, things are, people are questioning this narrative of the U.S. government is, can do no wrong. American people are exceptional. We rule the world. And American interests, which has always meant access to oil or other energy resources or other, other resources, American interests abroad, um, it's a very brainwashed people who don't go, why would my interest lie over there in the South China Sea in this little narrow strait between Taiwan, which is part of China, and China. How could American interest be in that? You know, I've been doing a series of geography quizzes, um, Reed, just because somebody, my husband probably said, I don't think the U.S. should be sending the U.S. Coast Guard to patrol the Black Sea until Americans can find it on a map, because I will guarantee you Americans cannot find the Black Sea on a map. So I always learn a lot when I make up my geography quizzes, but I publish them on my blog and I get a lot of positive feedback about them from readers who say, Ooh, I didn't do very well, but thanks. You know, thanks. That was good. Uh, thanks for doing that. Um, Americans are super ignorant of anything outside of the American exceptionalism uh, bubble. And in many cases, they don't even know they're ignorant. Um, but I think a multipolar world to me is going to be a lot safer and probably a lot more humane. Both Russia and China, as the other two big powers, uh, take much better care of their people than the U.S. does at this point. Yeah, well, I agree with all of that. I'm not going to go into uh, my apologetic for Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin or the Russian government. Uh, I just want to say that when you compare the two, uh, what the United States has done violently around the world, there's no evidence that Russia has done anywhere near the violence, the chaos, the killing, and the disruption. Now, I, want, I wanted to direct your attention to something that I think is really profound. You quoted... Caitlin Johnson, an Australian, John Stone, mm -hmm. an Australian mom and journalist. She's brilliant. Um, she said, humans have two adulthoods. I thought, oh, that's really cool. The first is physical maturity, and the second is intellectual maturity. Lisa, expand a little bit on that. Because I think that is the crux of the issue. Yeah, I think she's talking about the ability to see outside the propaganda box you've been put in and question the basic assumptions of uh, a false dichotomy. You know, there are only two sides. It's a binary and one side's right and one side's wrong. That's very childish thinking. So a few situations in life are, 
are of that nature. So, um, you know, Caitlin's uh, Australian. Australia is not unlike the U.S. in this regard. I have some family there and I've been there and it's it's not much different, but she's married to an American. And of course, America is a much, much bigger force for violence in the world than Australia has been. Um, but she writes a lot about um, our obligation as adults to expand our own consciousness and be willing to set aside our um, assumptions that aren't working well to help us understand what's going on and be open to letting go of those things, even if it feels scary at the time, even if you don't know what you're going to replace it with, um, you're more likely to arrive at a, a workable truth and one you can base your actions on by, you know, being honest with yourself about it. Right now, the U.S. has itself in the situation where, uh, you know, at the highest levels of government, they tell themselves lies about what we're doing and why and how it's going. Um, and then make decisions based on that wishful thinking, those wishful lies that they told themselves. That is not a recipe for success. Um, if you're going to succeed in the kind of violent competitions they insist on entering into, uh, you've got to be very realistic about your goals and your resources and your opponents and their, you know, when's, Na when, when's the last war NATO won? Um, we NATO just makes wars, but it destroys countries. I mean, poor Libya, you know, tens of thousands of people died in flooding in Libya because the dams burst that haven't been uh, properly maintained since the NATO took out Gaddafi's government that was taking care of its people um, because he threatened to uh, bring Africa's, Africans together with a common currency and a com an economic cooperation. Can't have that. Um, took him right out. But now that there are more catastrophic weather events all the time, many of the countries that the U.S. had or, you know, it's it and its NATO buddies had bombed into oblivion are really not in a position to sustain a huge flood or, um, you know, look at Pakistan too, uh, you know, where we just took out their a democratically, you know, elected um, popular prime minister because he wasn't cooperative enough with the U.S. And so Imran Khan had to go. The U.S. has been operating like this since World War II with impunity, but uh, if you're a thinking adult, you're you're going even if you're benefiting from the empire, as I do from you know living in an affluent and comfortable life in the U.S. Um, it's going to come to an end sooner or later, and um, being clear about where we are uh, is the only thing that's going to save us from you know an, an all-out nuclear war. We're perilously close right now. Um, back in 1957, Mao Zedong wrote. Uh, something to the effect of uh, many people are talking about the danger of a third world war right now. This is 1957. Um, here's what uh, we have to say about that. Uh, world War I, social, the cause of socialism grew hugely. You know, um, the USSR became social, uh, Soviet Republic became a big socialist country. Then after World War II, a lot of, you know, more socialism grew worldwide. And so, World, if the imperialists are foolish enough to bring World War III to us, uh, I can't say uh, all everything about how it will go and how it will end, but I assure you that socialism will be advanced by that imperial war also, um, which is kind of encouraging and a, and a, a optimistic thought. But as we all know, um, the nuclear weapons exist in many, many, many countries of the world big enough to, to kill us all. And it's hard for us to believe that the people in charge would really ever do that. I, you always go, don't they have grandchildren or anyone they love? That, but um, when you're in the hubris bubble, that's why hubris is the downfall of the mighty, because they think they're so strong and wonderful. Nothing bad could befall them. Um, but they're, they're playing with fire right now. And it's, uh, I know we're all as you alluded to earlier, fearful about that, Regis. We live in fearful times. Lisa, I want to take you back to the to the blog you wrote because uh, there's a couple of more things that are that are really important, and I I would be remiss if I I didn't ask you about them. You said, and I quote again, "I prefer the discovery method of education 
but what is a reasonable response to the barrage of misinformation visited upon a typical American first grader? Uh, what was your response to that, Lisa? Well, again, uh, a first grader doesn't have enough um, background knowledge to be able to even have the question, could my government have been, how did 9-11 happen without my government allowing that and, you know, enabling that to happen? But it's different at different developmental ages. You know, for adults, the question that makes them open their mind would be quite different or statement that you might tell them. Um, I recently saw a film I really recommend to you uh, and your uh, viewers, if they can see it, called Israelism. It's a documentary that a young, uh, someone who grew up with with my youngest um, kid, I, so I've known him for years, worked on, and they showed it at a film festival here in Maine, and uh, the director gave a talk beforehand, this young person that I know, and they said, I was really into Israel as a young Jewish student, high school student, and I was studying everything I could find about it, and my teacher, Mr. Ramsey, who is also a teacher that a couple of my kids had, my own children, said, uh, what do you know, Eric, what do you know about the Palestinians? And that was all he said to Eric. And 20 years later, he's produced this documentary that's really interesting about how um, American Jews sort of many of them replaced the Jewish religion with the Israel religion. Um, they weren't very religious as those, you know, post-war generations, but uh, faith in Israel and adherence of Israel, no matter how wrong they might be, oh, you always have to defend Israel, became almost like a religion. It's a real interesting film. They do a good job of arguing their uh, thesis. And, um, you know, that's what I mean by discovery education. Uh, you know, it's asking the right question, opening someone's mind to a possibility is much more deep education strategy than just you and I, when we went through school, Regis, it was basically sage on a stage. In other words, the teacher was at the front of the room spewing knowledge and you were supposed to be taking it in. And some of us do better under that method of education than others. Many people find it very, really experiences are the only thing that we learn from. And um, so I, I liked Montessori education, that idea that the teacher's job or the parents is to set up a, um, an environment that is conducive to the child discovering through play and experimentation you know, something that they, they need to discover next. Um, that's not how the system of American education has typically worked, at least in my lifetime. Yeah. Uh, my three children uh, went through Montessori. Uh, the youngest one, several, several years. The two older ones were uh, like middle school and then high school, uh, a bit of high school. And I couldn't agree more. Uh, and then I homeschooled with my wife at the time, the two youngest boys, uh, precisely because we were trying to teach them how to learn and how to think for themselves. And I have to tell you that my entire education, which I thought was really good in many ways, was about taking notes and passing an exam. Four years of Jesuit education in Rome was never about raising your hand, never about asking questions. It was going to a lecture, taking notes, and then taking an exam, feeding back what they gave you. But in that process, I became somewhat of a cynic. I was a prisoner of the educational system. If I wanted to succeed, I had to do it. I had to, I had to play the game. But it was because of that, at that stage in my young adult life, that I began to question everything. And I really think that that process of discovery, not telling, teaching, but guiding children, much as the Montessori and other methods do to help ch children work together 
and to examine things from many different perspectives and to listen to each other. Now, Lisa, what do we tell a first grader about 9-11? Who done it? Was it was it Ahab the Arab? Was it uh, was it Osama bin Laden and nine of these cave dwellers that came over and flew those airplanes? What, what do we tell them? Well, I put, think I put right in my blog. Um, you know, your your government had you know was involved in 9-11. That was as far as I went with a first grader um, because it doesn't really matter what the particulars of it are. If he becomes interested in that and wants to study it at that depth, you know, fine. But, you know, the main thing, uh, you don't, you don't have to tell a first grader a whole, whole lot about a historical event that happened for him so long ago, you know, 22 Before years. they were even born. Yeah. Long before he was born. So um, again, you know, I don't, I don't want to be heavy handed and I certainly don't ever insist that a young person that either that I love in my family or that I have as a student, they don't have to agree with me. They don't have to believe what I believe. Um, and I respect them as a human being, as a fellow human being. They don't have to like school or be good learners for me to respect them as a human being. Um, but I, I really enjoy being with curious you know, I'll leave you. I've written about this before in my blog. Another grandchild of mine was quite young, three years old, and was told by uh, the parents about Gaza being bombed that year. And um, so, the, you know, this child was very thinks things through and said, What do you mean? Like bombs, like dropping bombs, like on people? And we said, Yeah, you know, the parents said, Yeah, unfortunately. So, uh, uh, my granddaughter made up a slow, uh, chant, no, no dropping bombs on people's heads. She was at that young age where she, and I can remember being that young and incredulous myself, like, what are you talking about? What? <laughs> people kill people, you know, families, children, bomb cities, what? So she went around chanting it and she would tap it out. She'd tap it out on the wall and say to me, do you know what I tapped out? And I said, no dropping bombs on people's heads. Yeah, she'd tap it out on her baby brother's head, you know, um, so little kids can make a lot of sense out of information if it's presented to them in a way where they can process, they can ask questions, there's support there for their feelings about it. Cause she felt strongly that that was wrong. And, um, you know, how could people not see that that was wrong? I love that about young children. Adults tend to get in this jaded, well, you know, it's always been that way. So we have to accept it. We do not have to accept it. We don't. <laughs> you know, you also wrote, uh, you know, your, your government may have been involved in it, but you you may go to school and say this, and some people will get mad at you. My goodness, this is really good advice for adults. <laughs> if you say some of these in public, uh, people are going to get mad at you. Okay. Not only will they get mad at you, call you a conspiracy theorist, a nut job. They can call you treasonous uh, and they can disown you, which I'm sure many of us have experienced all of the above. Indeed. Lisa, I can't thank you enough. It's always a great pleasure to delve into these different topics that you are so eloquently writing about in your blog. And I'm going to put the blog address over parts of this video and encourage people to subscribe. Thanks, Thank Regis. You. Thank you. It's, it's great talking to you. And uh, we're thinking of your safety, you and Tanya, every day and the people of Crimea and the people of Ukraine. We think of you every day and hope that no one's dropping bombs on people's heads. <laughs>